Hi again. Uh, so we'll start at our uh, first lecture. Uh, we'll be presenting Ori and uh, Yoni from AppSolver. They will be speaking about deep learning, and uh, I'll give them the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to see so many familiar faces also. Uh, my name is, uh, is Ori. This is my partner, Yoni. We come from a company called AppSolver. We come from a company called AppSolver. Uh, it was the first company in the house in uh, Yaws Tech Innovate. What's the right name, uh, Rinat? The full name? The, the current full name? Our Ad Tech Innovation Program. The, we're the first company in the Ad Tech Innovation Program. Uh, we stayed here for, for a long time, and that was, was a very good reason to do our first uh, event with the... Uh, actually, I think it's the first event we host as a company, and it's with, uh, with Yao. Woo! Uh, <laughs> So we founded in uh, early 2014 our offices in Tel Aviv in, uh, in Hashmonaim. Uh, we are nine people, uh, currently in the process of growing, having our first customers and uh, also planning a very big launch for early 2016. Uh, we are using the platform to also saying that we are hiring across all, uh, all positions. <laughs> Thanks. And a little bit, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the business, about what we do. That's to, to give some context for Yoni's, uh, Yoni's lecture and, uh, uh, a little later. So we are coming from two major trends in the advertising world. The first is the, the, the move that you can see here to something called programmatic buying. You don't need to read every piece of uh, every word in this slide, but just look at the blue part and you can see there's a major decrease between 2011 to 2017 and, 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 and uh, it will be the same uh, afterwards. Uh, in 2011, uh, a person, an advertiser, that wanted to, to buy an ad unit usually did it using some kind of, some, uh, some form of direct sales. I mean, he needed to negotiate with a publisher and he, be, and he bought something like a billion impression, a billion eyeballs, a, bit, a billion views uh, in some kind of app or, or, or web, web application. What's happening now, uh, what you can see in 2017, is that uh, this buying, this buying is becoming programmatic, automated, uh, very similar to the process that we could see in the finance world, we can see right now in the advertising world. That means that companies need to decide in split seconds how much is, is a person worth in this thing, in this uh, given moment, and then decide whether how much are, you, are they willing to pay to show them the, the ad. This is the first change. It's really changing the way advertising is, 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 uh, is being seen today. It started uh, enough years ago that we had 24% uh, of the automated uh, part uh, a few years ago. But there is another change that's also, changing, that's also uh, making a big impact on the industry, and that's mobile advertising. So mobile advertising, you can see in 2013, was still a very, a very small percentage of uh, total advertising. And if you, we look a few years forward, it's going to be the, it's going to be the, the mainstream. And it's also changing the way we are doing data science in, in, in mobile advertising. So let's look at the data. I think we can look at, it, at what, what happened a few years ago and what's happening today. So a few years ago, we needed to understand who is the user, what is his likes, what is his dislikes, what he wants to, to purchase, she wants to purchase, and of course, what is the offer that we want to, to, to provide, as the stuff showed in, this, in the previous lecture. Today, we also have the device, we have the contact, we have the geo, the, 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 the geo location, we have the, uh, the exact timing, the weather is also uh, something that can influence us simply, a lot of, a lot of data, and uh, I also added something here which is quite small, but it's making a big, a big difference in mobile advertising. There is a lot of custom data, a lot of data that's been, that's been stored in CRM uh, 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 systems, in all sorts of databases that, uh, that the advertiser have, but he doesn't know how to use that data to do better, better uh, optimization. Uh, and they're also using different uh, target functions. It can be not only whether a user is going to click or is it going to install, but how much is he going to pay. If you're going to go to get taxi and offer them a paying user with a very uh, uh, specific uh, LTV, LTV is lifetime value, you're going to have a different talk than if you're gonna simply going to uh, offer a, a new user. So all of these 
amount of uh, all these new data and new options and different target functions are changing the, the way we did data science in, in advertising. But when Yoni and I started and we went to talk to many advertising companies, we saw that the, the, the mainstream approach is simply logistic regression and, uh, and regular feature engineering. Uh, which is no surprise, I'm guessing this is what the, the majority of the people here saw. By the way, Yaur is going to show what they're, they're doing, which is not standard in the next lecture, but this is definitely the, the world for not, internet, uh, for not internet giants. And there are a few problems with that, with that approach. The first problem is that you're not using all the data. You're maybe using 10%, 15% if you're good, of the data you have. That means both features and the rows that you, that you have. That was the first thing that we saw that really uh, lit the, how do you say it? Uh, uh, the the yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the second thing is that they're very, they're very bound by the, the understanding of human analysts of the data. It's very hard to understand data with so many, the, so many dimensions, which is very skewed. Everything that is very skewed. It's very hard to think, to think about it. Uh, and, and really understand what's going to happen and why is a person going to, to buy a certain ad. A lot of time you, you only understand the logic behind it in, res in retrospect. So that was the second thing. The last, it was, it was a really slow process. When you want to do any kind of, of data science uh, process in an ad tech company, it was very long. They were talking about processes of at least months or years with a lot of people. And the way which we, we want to do it is, is quite different. I think I didn't even say it in the beginning, but we are very much a deep learning company. I think we, Yoni and I first decided that we want to, buy, to build a deep learning company, and then we decided we want to build a deep learning company in the ad tech space, and uh, afterwards it, 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 the, the focus on deep learning, learning remains. And today I'm not even talking about the AppSolver product, it's just the AppSolver need, the tech, that's maybe called the tech angle, uh, and whoever wants to hear more about the product, we can do it, uh, we can do it later. So after we, we thought about those three things, we decided to open a deep learning company in the ad tech space. Uh, and there are a lot of challenges of doing deep learning, which is not classic deep learning. If you look at computer vision, for us, uh, computer vision is the classic deep learning. The data is really, is really, really different. First of all, and I'm sorry for any, if I'm making a mistake for any computer vision uh, company, the data, the data is relatively small. If you compare anything to ad tech, the data is relatively, is relatively small. It's, it's pixels, it's, a very, it's very static data, data. we are using uh, double, we have integers, we have uh, cyclic uh, time features, we have uh, session features, we have uh, date features. It's simply very co uh, co complicated to just make all these pieces of data uh, talk together and, and make sense together. Uh, the data is very sparse, it's very hard on the performance side. We are working with uh, hundreds of thousands per second of, uh, of uh, queries per second, and latency, which is supposed to be something around 20 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds, sometimes less, uh, which is a, a major challenge. And I think what we are doing today, and hopefully Yoni will, will manage to, to show that we are doing it well, is uh, doing deep learning at scale. That's the reason that uh, today our product is completely is completely proprietary. We are not using any of the of the uh, of the outsource uh, the, out, the outsourcing uh, the outsourcing the, the open source uh, uh, platforms. Uh, today we are using CUDA. We are using C sharp. Although we are slowly moving away from C sharp, uh, we are using Python, but only for uh, only for prototyping. Uh, and the product, uh, which we didn't talk about, but the product that we are building above our deep learning uh, infrastructure is mostly Scala-based, Amazon-based, it's uh, a regular Scala, uh, standard uh, SaaS product that is, uh, that is uh, using the, the, the data science, the deep learning uh, platform that we have. Any questions? Go. Do you build it, uh, the deep, deep learning uh, mechanism? Mm -hmm. Did you build it uh, yourself, or is it uh, using libraries? So the question was if you were using any deep learning libraries, or we build everything ourselves. And the answer is we build everything ourselves, mostly for performance reasons. Not only, but uh, I think mostly to work in throughput and latency that are that are, that are, uh, are required for doing better uh, advert for doing advertising. Um, anything else on that? Why not? That's it. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? 
we're trying to do more efficient uh, uh, mobile advertising, advertising, but also mobile advertising. We are optimizing clicks, uh, click prediction, uh, install prediction, payment prediction. We can take it uh, in a few, a few directions. We're, today we're only focusing on the technologies and it, we can use it in very different ways and it won't, it won't be very, uh, very easy to explain the product right now. But, yeah. Okay, so I'll, uh, is this a good distance of the microphone? Yeah, great. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, uh, I think Oli did a good job explaining the uh, technical hurdles. So I'm just going to start talking about deep learning. Um, I hope everyone here has at least a rudimentary understanding of, uh, of machine learning, because I'm not really going to explain that. Uh, I'm, this is just a refresher slide. So I'm going to be explaining how, uh, how gradient descent works, uh, just like a refresher. And really, it's going to be two minutes. Uh, or maybe, actually, can I have a show of hands who like, who knows this already? OK, fine. So it'll be two minutes. <laughs> um, so the idea of gradient descent is that we have a, a loss function that we're trying to optimize. And, and basically, we, uh, we take the uh, first derivative of the loss function uh, at, a, at the point that we're at in order to find out how we can go down and make the loss smaller. So that's the, the basic idea. We can take this derivative uh, pretty efficiently on all the parameters. So we do this once on all the parameters together and take a step of, uh, of gradient descent. And that way we get to a, to a more optimal place in the, in the air surface. And, and that way we basically just keep going until we get to somewhere that's relatively optimal. That's just the main idea. Now, in order to get good results, so it says here, uh, we need to find, first of all, a good error function. So, I mean, the gradient descent works with any kind of error function, but the error function should be uh, optimized for gradient descent so that it would work well. And also it has to represent what we actually want to figure out. So, so we need a good error function, and we'll talk about that just a little bit. And, and we also need a good learning rate algorithm. So what does that mean exactly? Um, this is what could happen if uh, the, the top image uh, if you don't have a good learning rate algorithm, this, this is what happens when the learning rate is too big. Uh, the first dot right on the bottom is where we start, and basically we get this, uh, we get a gradient that, that says go to the right, but we don't know how much to go to the right. So, I mean, we only know where we are now. We don't have visibility of the rest of the space. So we take a jump to the right, and we're a bit further now, just because we overshot, and again, we measure our gradients, and, and again, we, we have a stronger gradient, so we jump even, even further, and this is called divergence. This is what happens when we set our learning rate too high. So even though I have the right, the, the exact right uh, um, um, derivative, I can't actually, I, I can't know how far to jump, because I only know what, what's going on in the very, very local space. Uh, the, the flip side is that if I would set my learning rate too low, I would take really, really tiny steps and never get anywhere. And this, this is a process that takes a really long time. So, so we rather speed it up as much as we possibly can. Now, now the second thing, if we're talking about an error surface, so I'm going to take a derivative at a certain point in the error surface, and, and I need to take a step in the downwards direction. But nobody guarantees that, that taking a step in the downwards direction is even going to make sense. So I need an error surface that's relatively smooth, relatively uh, uh, convex. And this is something actually that deep learning doesn't guarantee. Great, um, um, logistic regression does guarantee a convex error surface, but deep learning doesn't. It's an, an approximation. And, and the picture on the bottom actually isn't a very good representation of an error surface. Uh, it reminds me that, that another reason to not have a very, very small step size is that you can easily get stuck in a local minimum like that. But that's not really a problem with deep learning. Um, the error surface generally looks more like the saddle on the right, and so there you don't really have that problem of getting stuck in a, in a high local minimum, but you can very easily spend a lot of time in the saddle without going anywhere. So, so that's pretty much what we want to avoid. We want to have as high a learning rate as possible without starting to diverge. So how do we do that? Uh, the simplest learning rate algorithm is just to use a fixed learning rate. Uh, 0.1 is, is a pretty good number. It works in a lot of problems. Uh, if it doesn't, you can you could try it out. And it's very easy to see if something's diverging, because you start with a, a certain log loss, and then suddenly it becomes a million. Um, so you just lower the learning rate, and then do that again until it actually doesn't diverge. 
And if you see that it's taking a while, like more than the amount of time you feel like waiting, so you can increase the learning rate and hope for the best. So this is a very simple algorithm. You can do it just any, with any package. You download deep learning package and, and it works. Um, the problem is that it doesn't work very well because when you get to the end of the learning, you have kind of a pretty big, you have a too high learning rate. And then you have a pretty big area that you're going to be jumping around and not really converging to exactly where you want to be. Um, so for that, we use annealing, which is usually just a, a, a decay factor that you add to your learning rate. And, and that works pretty well. Um, you start with your fixed learning rate. You slowly decay until you reach some kind of equilibrium. The only problem with that is that it doesn't work for trending data, which uh, actually Oli forgot to mention, but one of the big challenges of ad tech is that the data is really trending. It, uh, first of all, you have micro trends, like, for, like weeks or, or days or hours in the day or things like that. And you also have macro trends of just, well, new websites show up or, or there's Christmas all of a sudden or it's the summer vacation. So you have a lot of stuff that changes and I can't have my, my, uh, my, my network just become stationary at some point because my learning rate is too low. So I really need to be able to adapt to that. Um, but this is what everyone starts with, and it's pretty good. It works until you want to optimize further. And then when you want to optimize further, usually what people do is add momentum, which uh, it isn't actually momentum, but you can read the uh, uh, Hinton article, so he'll like, explain the whole uh, naming thing. But basically what you do is, is you take a step in a certain direction, and then you remember the speed that you're at, and, and just keep accumulating, accumulating the speed. And then the idea is that Oh, wait. <laughs> okay, anyways, I don't need that. Um, so the idea is that you keep accumulating speed as you go along. So if I take a small step in, in this direction, and then another small step in this direction, another small step in, step in this direction, I'm kind of telling the algorithm, okay, I get the idea. You're going to have to walk for quite a while in this direction, so just keep going. Like, take bigger steps. You can do it. Um, and this kind of introduces a... Uh, uh, a per parameter uh, vector. So we're not jumping the same distance in each direction because the momentum uh, accumulates per, per direction. And, and this is a really good system. It works very, very well. Uh, even just using a fixed learning rate with momentum will usually give you pretty good results, pretty optimal results. Um, and, and one small caveat is that the Nesterov uh, uh, momentum method is that you would first use the momentum, so first kind of roll the ball down the hill, and then figure out where you are, take your gradient, and, and correct. So that's just, it's a small optimization, it's actually the same algorithm, just you swap two terms, and it works much better. So, so everyone does that. Now all the, uh, any uh, package that you would use would have this already implemented, so you just need to turn it on. Um, a slightly more uh, complicated method, um, is called Adagrad. It's, uh, it's essentially the idea is that I do want to do annealing, but I'm afraid that what's going to happen is that I'm going to anneal too quickly. So, so what I do is I do an annealing rate that's basically relative to the amount of distance that I've traveled. Uh, so you see the, uh, the number in the denominator is basically um, the square root of the, uh, of the squared gradients that I've had s since the beginning of time. So this still has the same problem as a normal annealing, uh, uh, annealing rate, that, that it will eventually just stop learning, but it tends to do that a lot slower and not necessarily in all directions at the same time. And, and a direction that was working well is going to anneal pretty quickly in a direction that wasn't, so it'll, it'll wait basically until it gets good gradients and starts moving in that direction. So this is a really good system. It's also standard in almost all the packages and, and pretty much the, the gold standard. Like a lot of people are using this. Um, there are just a few methods that are, that are a bit, that are tweaked basically on top of Adagrad, but this is really <clears throat> an excellent base. Um, you can combine it with momentum. It, they're completely uh, like you, it, just one on top of the other, and it works excellent. But again, we still have the problem that, that it doesn't work for trending data. Because if my error surface changed, I'm, I've already accumulated a lot, of, a lot of baggage that I can't get rid of. So I don't have a slide for this. This is the next slide, add a delta, which is pretty complicated. 
Um, but what I'm going to do is just explain as kind of a, a, a general idea what RMS prop is, which is in between Adagrad and Adadelta, and then I'll jump right back to Adadelta. RMS prop is basically just a worse Adadelta. Uh, it's just this equation without the uh, with a one in the uh, in the nominator, and and what it does is is basically you do Adagrad, but instead of accumulating from the beginning of time, you accumulate over a window. So so instead of looking at the since one till a million, you start you look at the last one hundred, and that it basically does Adagrad. It's as good, except it does allow you to do trending data. So that's like an obvious win, especially for ad tech and in general. So that's uh, uh, Hinton really recommends using uh, using RMS prop. Adadelta is the same, except it adds a regularization term in the nominator, and and that works really well. It helps you deal with uh, outliers in the data, which is very important. Sometimes you have, uh, since we're not doing a full gradient descent, uh, the air surface changes around a lot, and sometimes we have uh, we have samples that are really very different, and then suddenly with uh, Adagrad you can find yourself taking a huge step in some direction because there's nothing preventing you from doing that. So here the way, I'm not going to go into the math, uh, you can find it's actually like eight lines of code to do this, um, but uh, but the, the way it works because there's a t minus one in the denominator, basically um, any any big change in the data is going to get ignored because it goes first into the uh, First into the denominator, um, so it's a teeny bit harder to implement. It's not terrible. You can find an implementation online. A lot of the packages can uh, include it, although not all of them. And and but this is really very good. This is what we use now. Uh, we tried all of the above plus another three or four methods. So so this is definitely the one that had the best trade-off of performance and and speed of uh, convergence versus just how complicated it is. Um, I'm going to quickly go over a couple of second order methods. These are a lot more complicated. Um, basically, they work on the, under the assumption that while the derivative is really nice because it tells me which way is down, um, it doesn't tell me the whole story. As you can see, it's not really clear here, but the top one is the worst situation where I actually have, it's really not clear from the picture, but I have, uh, I have a small blue uh, arrow which is basically, that's how much I stand to gain. So that was supposed to be a lot smaller in the picture. But the idea is that the derivative is very high. You can see that the, uh, that the slope is, is very extreme at the red dot, but the blue arrow isn't that big. Whereas the bigger one, is the, the, the second image, has a much bigger blue arrow. Imagine that it's 10 times bigger, so it would, so it would work. And, but the slope is really negligible. It's like I would almost not move in this direction. And, and the reason is that the first derivative is much higher in the, uh, in the first one, but the second derivative is, is, uh, is higher in the second one. And what I care about is the ratio, actually, be between the two. So, so what I want to do here is, is use some kind of information on the second derivative in order to understand how to take, how far should I go. And I can't really do that because the second derivative is, is huge, so you can't calculate the second derivative, and then you have all sorts of ways of approximating it. So uh, CG and LBFGS are two methods that, that you should absolutely not try to implement yourself. Uh, there are a couple of implementations, they're not all good. Uh, you can read, uh, Andrew Ng uses them a lot, so you can read what, like, what packages he uses and, and use those, but it's going to be hard to adapt them to, to specific needs, that's the reason we don't use them, and plus they're pretty slow. Uh, maybe like a factor of uh, five or six times slower than, uh, than the other methods, although they do converge faster in less steps. They just, it takes a lot longer to process it because you have a lot more terms. Uh, VSGD is actually um, not that new anymore. Uh, that's uh, Jan LeCun, uh, that if anyone's interested, that's actually a really interesting method and interesting papers that describe the method. Um, but it's also super complicated. Um, I don't know of any uh, actual production use of the method. It's more theoretical, but there's uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting there are a lot of interesting concepts there. So I definitely recommend that as a read for anyone who wants to get into this uh, uh, this topic. Um, and and that uh, again, it seems like a good system. We didn't get it working properly, so uh, so that's still kind of in the uh, theoretical area. But but we're still giving it a little bit of time to see if if we can get it there. It, it looks promising but we haven't seen the results that we were expecting. 
Um, so I think that's it as far as uh, learning methods, but I'd love to take questions. Yeah. Say that again, sorry? sorry uh, about uh, your choice to, to build a proprietary uh, deep learning engine. So what would, what would the actual bottlenecks make you want to avoid those? Uh, the, yeah. The package of deep learning engines. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, basically, he was asking why we chose to build our own propriety, uh, proprietary engine. What were the bottlenecks that, that made us reach this decision? Obviously, it was a lot of work, so it wasn't a decision we took too lightly. Um, but basically, it was, a, it was several factors. First of all, uh, generally, the deep learning packages uh, focus on vision. So you have a lot of stuff that has to do with convolutional networks, not much that has to do with fully connected networks. Um, plus, we have, uh, we have, because it's ad tech and not image, you have very sparse input vectors, kind of like what you would see in NLP, but even worse. So in NLP, you might have uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of, uh, of input nodes, and we might have millions or tens of millions of input nodes. So this is something that it doesn't even fit in the GPU memory. Um, and that makes it really, uh, really difficult to work with uh, using standard, uh, standard packages. So we... Sorry. So it's almost like um, transferring uh, data into the GPU memory back, back and forth? Uh, well, that's just one of the, uh, he asked if, that, if the, the main thing is transferring the data back and forth. So that's one of the things. Uh, also, a lot of the implementations aren't actually that performance, uh, uh, they don't care that much about performance, understandably, because you usually don't need to get a response within a few milliseconds. And, uh, and since we do, we, we made sure to do everything as, as efficiently as possible so that, so that we would actually be able to respond to the amount of, uh, of requests that we get and in, in the time frame that we have. And just to remind you, we have uh, something on the lines of uh, 100 to 200,000 requests per second, and, and we need to really respond within a few milliseconds. So Oli was saying 25 to 30, but it's really closer to two or three or four uh, for the actual uh, deep learning, because you have also a lot of enrichments and things like that that take a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, what's the rate you actually train your model? Like every day, every couple of hours? Because you do a, yeah. some kind of learning uh, mechanism. So, so it really depends on the data that we're training on. Um, uh, one of the big problems of ad tech data is that the attribution happens a long time after, uh, especially if you're talking about, uh, let's say, app installs or purchases or things like that. So. So that kind of limits, you can, you can obviously train every five minutes, but if you're dealing with data that's three days old anyways, uh, so you kind of may as well train it at a lower interval. Uh, that being said, our system does support online training. Uh, we built it like, so that it would do that. We thought that would be necessary. Um, uh, in reality, we train, depends on the, on, on the situation, either once an hour or once a day or things like that. Yeah. Um, it's kind of, it's close to that, but, uh, but it's, well, yeah, I mean, you could say, you could say that it's kind of like using a second order derivative, but you're not actually computing any second order derivative and it's only in the same direction that you're going. So it's, it's kind of like computing the second order derivative of the diagonal. Um, and even that it's, it's a bit of a stretch. So yes, like it's, it's in the same direction kind of, but, but not close enough that I would say that I would call it a second order derivative method. Yeah. How do you measure yourself, and do you compare yourself to a regular, like the standard uh, methods? Yeah, so the question was, uh, how do we measure ourselves, and do we compare ourselves to the standard methods? Um, so, first of all, yes. Um, the measurement usually would use several metrics. Obviously, there's a log loss, but it doesn't mean very much. Um, so, it is good for comparing two different, uh, let's say, if I want to test two different learning methods, likely that the one with the lower log loss would be better. Uh, AUC is a pretty good, uh, area under curve is a pretty good metric uh, for some questions, not excellent for all questions. Um, but revenue is actually like what we'd want to do and what we would, what we uh, try to do in order to compare different uh, algorithms, so, so, or different models that we generated based on the same algorithm is a projected revenue. Because that's really the, 
projective, but you can measure like uh, the actual revenue, right? Um, well, you can't really measure the. This one will work with this algorithm for one day. The other, the other algorithm. And let's see who is making more revenue. Yeah. So okay. So basically, the the context here is a reinforcement learning uh, uh, question, and and it's true that you can do A/B testing, obviously, and and you can do multi uh, multi I forget what it's called, but multi with mu multivariant yeah. testing, um, that uh, that also helps. But all of these things cost you money because you're spending money. So this is basically part of your exploration. Uh, but what you really want to do is get something that's as close to uh, to the truth as possible before you actually deploy a model. Uh, especially if you're doing research. So for if, if I have a certain algorithm and I run it every hour, okay, I'll deploy the new model. But if I have a completely new algorithm, I want to make sure that I'm not going to be losing money on it. So, so there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot to be gained by estimating how much you're actually going uh, gonna to earn uh, in offline. What do you, yeah. what do you estimate? It? Because uh, the click rate might be even negatively correlated to revenue. You know, it could be hectic and uh, not finding what you're actually looking for. Yeah. Just clicking around. So, uh, so I'll repeat the question. I was saying, how, how do you actually measure the revenue? Because click rate might not be correlated with revenue at all. Uh, that's very true, especially in mobile. There's the issue of fat fingers that adds so much noise to clicks that it's almost worthless. Um, but uh, another thing that I didn't talk about at all is that we also uh, try to uh, deal with skewed data as well as possible. So, so basically what we do is we predict conversions directly and then basically skip the, the middle tier of clicks that, that's very noisy. Uh, if, if it's not that noisy, then we would add that as well, but we would always be optimizing the log loss for conversions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll repeat the question. First of all, the question was uh, what input features do we use? And then the second, the, the uh, additional question was uh, why not just use a simple method and, and did we compare ourselves to, to basic methods? Uh, so first of all, we, um, I'll answer the second question first. We definitely compared ourselves to all sorts of other methods. Um, for us, by the way, once our, once our deep learning infrastructure was ready, so it was the same for us to train it as deep learning or logistic regression. Logistic regression is basically deep learning with zero layers. And, and we definitely saw a, a big uh, uplift using deep learning, depending on the data. So there was always an uplift. It wasn't uh, agnostic, even with very little data. But, but the more data we added, the more you could see the effect of deep learning. Um, and, and, and yeah, and well, we tried. Uh, we also here in Yahoo compared it to, uh, to random forest, for example. And, uh, and generally, we saw much better performance from deep learning. Like it, uh, it was a gambit in the beginning, but it did pay off. Uh, so we're happy about that. Um, and as far as the uh, input features, so it's basically it's uh, divided into several categories. I'll go back to, um, let's see if I can find it. There we go. I can't read from here, so I'll look this way. Um, but uh, okay, so we have basically features that that have to do with the user. So anything that we know about them, like if. If you have gender or you don't, sometimes you can match a user to, to previous interactions and then find out more about him than you would normally know. Uh, you have stuff that has to do with the offer. So uh, for example, this is, a good, uh, this is a good example of where logistic regression falls short, that you can't really use the, uh, the advertiser as a feature in logistic regression because it's too, the model is too flat. You, don't get, you can get a signal that the advertiser is good or the advertiser is bad. But you can't really get a signal of the advertiser is good with this kind of user. So, so you have a very one-dimensional outlook of, of how things piece together. And then when you add to that a device model, so you have, I mean, imagine that you have even an iPhone app that, that works really well with a certain advertiser, but their, their ad isn't, isn't optimized for Android, so it doesn't even display. And logistic regression just can't can't figure that out. It can't realize that, that just put it with iPhone and not with Android. It, it can't represent that. So, so really little things like that, that you can really see that um, in general also the ad tech community doesn't really have an answer for mobile. And I think a lot of that is because of the simplistic uh, methods that they're using. Not to say that they're bad, but they're just not, 
they're not good when you have very high dimensional and very uh, interconnected data. Um, so so that's, that's just part of it. And you have all the rest, you can see. Um, but we use a lot of features. Yeah. You said millions of features? Yeah, basically what we do um, for a lot of the features, uh, for example, if you have a, a banner displayed on a website, so we use the website as, uh, as um, sorry, but, uh, <laughs> uh, we use the website as a one-hot encoded feature. So if we have 80,000 websites uh, that we were exposed to, that's 80,000 features that are one-hot encoded. Um, and and you can, there are a lot of other features like that, um, all sorts of user features that are very highly dimensional. So basically the fact that you have categor categorical data really, really increases the amount of features you have. So you don't use one feature with a lot of uh, possible values? Uh, no, you it's it like a yeah, yeah, dummy yeah. It's generally uh, it's just much much better to use dummy val variables. Like uh, deep learning specifically, just won't work with uh, with a feature that's one two three four five. It just won't work at all. Don't even like you can try it, but it won't. Um, and but one hot encoding is generally considered to be the better solution. Actually, a lot of uh, researchers, even numerical values that have an inherent order, turn it into a one-hot encoded value, just because it's easier for them, that's what their system knows how to do, and, and they get slightly better results. But that, again, it increases the amount, of, uh, the amount of data you have. You have to do bucketing and stuff like that. So we don't do that. We use uh, numeric values as they are. How many layers do you end up with? Um, it really depends. Uh, the amount of layers affects the performance. So if we're in a situation where we need to answer within one or two milliseconds, we do, let's say, uh, two layers, maybe three layers, uh, and we can go higher. Um, we see a lot of diminishing returns, so so generally we wouldn't go much higher than than four or five, unless like we would try obviously bigger networks. And if we don't see any value, then we then we scale down. Like we prefer to conserve. Uh, I'd say I'd say you should go like try uh, try three. Three is a good number. Uh, we generally see two is worse than three. And then uh, and and just check your data. Like try to go up, and at some point you'll see diminishing returns. Yeah. Is it a simple fold Yeah, yeah. Um, in what terms the do in what terms are you uh, like deep in the net? Because I'm used to when talking in the context of deep learning um, to to some components that were missing during the, this presentation, like. Let's say max pooling. You say you do uh, fully uh, connected network. So what's the difference between what what do you do to a uh, uh, regular neural network? Yeah. Okay. So I'll repeat the question. Basically, he was asking um, like a lot of things were missing from your uh, presentation, like max pooling and things like that. And and what's the difference between what you're doing and a normal neural network? So first of all, the answer is nothing's different. It's pretty much the same. Uh, but uh, what you're talking about, max pooling, is, is part of a convolutional network, which is used for image, and that assumes a data locality. So that basically two pixels that are one next to the other represent pretty much the same thing. And, and that, uh, we can't assume that in our situation, because, uh, just because we don't have that data locality between our, uh, our inputs. So, so we, need to, to, we need to adapt. Uh, that's why we, we're not using like, image-based uh, research. Uh, in, in, our, in our system. So, so it's just we're trying to solve a different problem and then you have different tools, but it's all under the same category. Like max pooling is just something that people do. Convolution networks is something that people do. You can also, with a fully connected layer, solve image problems. It's just harder. Yeah? Um, how do you split the training set from the test set? Because I know that, you know, uh, if you accidentally mix yeah. the same user, for example, interactions in the training and in the test, you can easily overfit. Yeah, so, uh, so basically um, there are several, uh, it, it also depends what kind of feed. The question was how do we split our train and test data, and if we mix user interactions between them, it can cause problems. So first of all, what we would do is we would divide it by time. So the train set would generally be X amount of time backwards, and then the test set would be uh, the more la the later uh, impressions, and that way you don't have any problem. You can also split it on users. That's a lot more useful when you're why, why, training why, RNNs. Excuse me. Yeah. Why do you think you wouldn't have any problems if you have the same users 
interacting in the past and is coming in the future. Well, yeah, but that's a good thing because in general, I'm training on the past in order to learn for the future. Once I've created a model, I can then use this model that was trained on the past to also train on the future of all the new data. So this is actually representing our, our real world use case. We're not, we're not going to be overfitting in, in that situation. Uh, if you're training RNNs, it's useful to have an entire user and then you can partition by user. Um, but generally, it's very important. Like what, what you say is true. It's very, very easy to make mistakes and, and accidentally overfit your training and just everything blows up. So be very careful not to do that. Uh, there was another question over there. Last one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, say that again. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, I, I was wondering how, how those methods uh, compare in terms of parallelization. If I have like a cluster of machines and I want to do it in a certain kind of distribution, how does that compare to the past? Yeah, okay. So the question was how does this uh, uh, work when you try to parallelize it? So basically, there's a very good article uh, called uh, Hogwild uh, about uh, cluster parallelization. Um, that's, uh, it's a bit old. They use uh, CPUs and not GPUs, but it's the same concept. But basically, the idea is that things don't change that much in between, uh, in between steps. So, so you just uh, update ad hoc and hope for the best, and it works. Um, uh, we don't do that, uh, could also because of our latency requirements uh, for the online version. So we, have, we want to make sure that our model fits in memory in one computer and that we can uh, use it uh, in a timely manner. So we just do it serially. Uh, what we do do is parallelize in between uh, in between steps and things like that. But generally, the, uh, the learning method is, is pretty agnostic to, to any kind of parallelization. That's not going to be your problem. Uh, what's more difficult is the back propagation. So you can pick whatever you want. If you're parallelizing, it all works with Hogwild. Yeah, OK, so I think that's it. Thank you very much.